In 1999, Aotearoa elected the world's first transgender member of parliament. Georgina Byer stood for Labour in Wairarapa, but during her three terms, she represented some of the most vulnerable New Zealanders, Māori and the LGBTQIA plus communities. In 1868, the first Māori MPs entered New Zealand's House of Representatives. Today, there have never been more Māori in Parliament. They span the political and cultural spectrum and continue to leave an indelible mark on our political landscape. In this series, we'll explore the legacies of former Māori MPs as they reflect on their time in politics. I'm Scott Campbell, communications specialist and former political reporter. This is Mātangi Reia. Kia ora, Georgina Baia tuku wengua. I am uh, a takatāpui, whakawahine of Te Atiawa, Ngāti Mutunga, Ngāti Poroa, Ngāti Raukawa descent. I am proud and I am out. I want to start almost near the end uh, of your parliamentary time. 2004, and a memory that sticks out for me on the forecourt of Parliament, that wave of black shirts coming up onto the forecourt and standing out there, almost alone, was you. What Aye. do you remember about that day? It was an awesome day. Um, and it was a horrifying day in many respects. The Destiny Church and the Enough is Enough March was standing up for family values and railing against the Civil Union Act that was in the process um, at the time. And this, amongst other things, sort of uh, generated this, uh, this response uh, from Brian Tamaki and his church. So about 8,000 protested that day and marched from Civic Square in Wellington. And they had put many children on the front of their march. They were all dressed in black. And as they were marching in Roman formation uh, through the city, they were sort of going, and enough is enough, and punching the air. But I didn't know this was happening when I went out to stand on the steps to greet them. <laughs> I would defend their right to protest. Everybody has a right to protest in a peaceful manner, and that they did. I certainly didn't agree what they were protesting against and I wanted to be a symbol, at least standing out on the steps uh, to welcome them to the Parliament grounds, but to also send a, a message that um, I'm going to stare you down and I'm going to challenge you on that. And often in some of the television footage that you see of that, Brian Tamaki is seen turning around and pointing towards the steps of Parliament. He's actually pointing at me and criticising me, the government and all of that um, over our permissive ways and the moral decay of the country and, and that kind of thing. And so I guess for me, that's what it conjures up that memory of you being, you standing there in the face of thousands of people, mm. them pointing at you, a number of them shouting mm -hmm. things at you. Absolutely. There was a lot of abuse, verbal. <laughs> I, I felt scared yeah. for you at points. Where did that bravery come from? What, what were the courage to stand out there in front of them? People call it courage and bravery. I just called standing for, up for what I thought was right. And sticks and stones, you can throw all you like at me, insults. I've dealt with worse in my past, so I can deal with that. We also had uh, pro-civil union supporters who were gather around the Seddon statue in front of Parliament. And when the marchers arrived on parliamentary grounds, 
it looked like a cancer was spreading across the grass and, and everything, and our poor supporters were utterly surrounded by them and being abused by them. I guess I wanted our people there to know that I'm standing here and you can see me, I'm holding your rainbow flag. And I've had many of them say to me afterwards that they found that a very, um, a thing that kept them anchored and that they were doing the right thing, despite the fact they were being abused most horribly. So I just think that symbolism of, of me being there and I'm on that side of the fence <laughs> gave them some strength. So I want to go now to your childhood then, because mm. it's a nice segue to go back there. Talk me through that. So born in Wellington, uh, and a fairly rocky start from, from early on. Sort of, really. Um, yes, in some respects, my uh, mother had divorced my uh, birth father, Jack Bertrand, when I was about one year old. Um, she uh, was then a solo mother in the late 1950s, was not an enviable place to be for a woman, uh, certainly not a Māori woman, and uh, she was uh, training as a nurse at Bowen Hospital at the time. And my father was sent to jail for an indiscretion, he was a policeman, and during that period uh, she divorced him. She'd also fallen pregnant before he went into jail, again with a second child, and had that child adopted out at birth. I was put into the Newtown Salvation Army hostel facility for a period of time while my mother got herself sorted, but she was so horrified by the care that was being given to me there that she had persuaded her now quite elderly parents, having just dispatched eight children from their home, <laughs> and, um, and they agreed to whāngai me, I guess. And that's where I went uh, for probably the first four years of my life. And, and that was sort of fine. Then my mother remarried in the early 1960s to Colin Byer. And when that marriage happened, I um, was brought back down from Taranaki, where my grandparents lived and had a farm and began my life with this uh, new relationship. And, and, and what did those early years do for you? How did they shape you? Well, I wasn't deprived, put it that way. <clears throat> my stepfather, Colin Byer, was a barrister and solicitor. We were mildly well off. I had a relatively good education, a mix of state and private school. I went to Wellesley Preparatory School for Boys, or Wellesley College, as they call it now. But of course, from about the age of four, I had displayed and started to display some quite effeminate behaviour a um, tendency towards things feminine. And while it was a bit cute for the adults around me to have me sort of dressing up and things like that, uh, when I got to a, about seven or eight years of age, that was then frowned upon. And that was reinforced with punishment for that kind of behaviour. Physical punishment, verbal punishment, mental cruelty, really. Not unusual for many people of my generation who went through that, who were having uh, difficulties with their gender identity is what it would turn out to be. So, so you named after your grandfather? I'm named after my mother's, uh, sorry, my father's father. He was Lieutenant Colonel George Bertrand. He was 2IC, second in command of the 28th Māori Battalion under General Ditmer. He, after the war, he became a uh, master at New Plymouth Boys High School but um, he sadly he died in a car accident in uh, 1957, the year I was born, hence why I was originally called George. And so at what point did you decide or did you notice that you wanted to be a Georgina, not a George? I probably came to that sort of, uh, that's the direction I'm going in when I was about 16, but I had no idea how to achieve that. But when you were younger, you were quite happy to dress up and you were in... Yes, but the punishment like meant I started to do it secretively and um, deviously, frankly, because if I was caught or discovered or anything like that, it would be dealt with uh, physical punishment, corporal punishment, um, beatings, hidings, things like that, to uh, beat it out of me, I suppose. And uh, quite cruel. I don't forgive my parents at all at that time for that kind of uh, behaviour then, but on the other hand, I can't really blame them. That was the convention of the day. I, I soon discovered, really, that I was having to pay the price for their shame and their embarrassment. And when I relieved myself of the guilt around that, I liberated myself entirely, and I lay it on their doorstep that, uh, you know, that's actually your issue, not mine. You made it my issue by the way you reacted. Do you think back to that time and wonder what it would have been like without the beatings and...? If I had been loved regardless of my um, gender issues, 
and stuff like that. Yes, it would have been vastly different if there had been love rather than contempt. Uh, yeah, it would have been different. So you don't blame them for what happened? Well, no, because I think the mores of the day, the morals of the day about such things as being gay or trans or anything like that uh, was just an absolute um, no-no. There wasn't a lot of information around in those days. It was just a taboo thing, and that's the way it was. Well, thank God the world has changed tenfold since then. <laughs> so how did you express yourself at that point? Well... Devious little ways like becoming involved with theatre and drama, because then you can go and wear costumes and it's perfectly okay to put makeup on, you know, stage makeup and things like that. And I was able to, in an acceptable way, sort of enjoy and be, you know, that sort of thing. I was in a sort of an environment where that was permissible, although acting and drama and things like that was in those days seen as being a bit sissy for a boy thing to do. Um, but I mixed that with that school reluctantly playing rugby and all the boys' sports. I just couldn't quite work out why, where this drama acting thing would come from. But I found that as one way of being able to, um, <laughs> to be more who I wanted to be. <laughs> who did you um, look up to at that point of time? Because I imagine with mum and dad or, or, or your whanau at home, at times putting you in those difficult situations, who did you turn to? Nobody. And I think that's, you know, that, that's the, uh, those are the scars that are left that at a young, impressionable age, I guess, at that time, vulnerable and certainly not worldly yet, it was something I just buried and suppressed. And when, of course, I got older and went to college and, and, and that kind of thing, I had just learnt to hide it very well. Did you ever think, stand, sitting back in those days, that you would have been that person standing on the steps of Parliament? Not at all. Politics was the furthest thing. I mean, good God, I was managing enough, hard enough anyhow. Yes, my childhood and adolescence and then leaving home, leaving school and then finding my pathway to being the woman I have become. And that came with its own downside, uh, social disapproval, et cetera, and all of that kind of thing. And all I wanted to do, particularly when I ended up becoming involved with the sex industry. I wanted to get out of it as soon as I could, and that took five, six years before I could actually change that. But I still kept my interest in the entertainment industry and in drama and acting by being able to get involved in a few things and certainly shows and things. And so I was just glad to not have to be um, doing sex work anymore in order to make a living and the barriers that one met back in those days toward having a conventional working life or anything like that were just seemingly insurmountable. Was the streets just a, I guess, a natural progression of the childhood and, and where you'd come from? No, not at all. Um, the streets would have been the last thing I'd wanted to do, but uh, the social disapproval extended into institutional prejudice and discrimination. I didn't want to be a sex worker. Oh, God, I didn't even know how to. I was too young. I, mean, I was 16 going on 17. But when I went to apply for the unemployment benefit, I was simply told, uh, well, be the man you're supposed to be and go out there and get a job. And I guess that's when I first drew a line in the sand without knowing I was making a political statement and said, no, this is who and what I am and I'm not changing it for anybody. So if I have to suffer your disapproval over this, then I guess I just have to suffer it. In other words, trannies, in many respects, were the lowest of the low. We belonged in the gutter. And that's where many of us ended up being. But in saying that, many of my contemporaries at the time, we supported each other. Uh, we tried to look out for each other um, because we were not protected by the law. In fact, it worked against us. It had nothing for us. And if there's any sort of courage and persistence, it is, or would have been easier to say, oh, I think I'll go back to being a bloke. Life's much easier that way. Uh, no, I just, I, I couldn't live a lie. I just had to be who I am. And uh, if that is some of the consequence of it, I just have to bear it. I guess it was a little bit later in life that I began to think, actually, that's not right at all, and how do we change this? So if we go back to your childhood, were you brought up in the real or around Tikanga? No. Uh, very little exposure to my Māori heritage. 
Uh, my mother had been chosen out of her family of eight to be one of only a few children that were going to get educated. My mother went to a boarding school in Stratford, I think, for a while. And during that process, I think she learned to be Māori was a minus and to attain being as parkified as possible was a driving force for her. And therefore that uh, also came down to her children. But you knew you were Māori? Aye. And do you think you missed out? I did, I do. Because I could certainly use it now, and I guess, you know, you could say, well, you know, you can go and learn it now or whatever. But I found there's sometimes a bit of looking down their nose at you for those that aren't versed in the reo or steeped in tikanga and da 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 da. I did give it a shot in about 1991. I did a year's Māori performing arts course at Wairarapa Community Polytechnic, and I enjoyed that. And, and I guess the world opened up to me a bit more then, but as soon as that course was over, I had no one to converse with, and so much of what I had learned disappeared. Uh, but I had kept the textbooks, which came in very handy when I later became the mayor of Carterton, <laughs> to get me through porphyries and things like that. <laughs> we were talking not long ago about the streets uh, and what had pushed you, in your words, to the streets. Living that life, and I think you've said this before, on the fringes of society, mm -hmm. did that give you drive? What did it do for you? It did give me drive, because I always went in, you know, with this grudge, thinking I shouldn't have to be living like this. No human being should have to live this if they don't want to. Why can't I uh, live a conventional life when it comes to work, when it comes to just being integrated into society? This thing over my gender is what is providing the great barrier to that. And I began to think, what is the purpose of making social burdens out of people who mean no harm to anyone else, who actually do no harm to anyone else? And where is my right to be a positive participant in our society? And I thought that was wrong. So I guess I was beginning to sort of formulate, oh, an anger really. What I learned in my street scene, while I didn't like the work, I learned resilience. I learned how to tolerate and understand violence against me and abuse, verbal abuse, just from the general public, all of that thing that used to go on, that every time somebody said, yeah, little queer, you, you poofed her down the street and that kind of thing. Oh yeah, that knife would go through my heart of shame and, and all of that. And then one day I didn't bow my head. I looked it and stared it in the eye and I said, you have to bleep this out. <laughs> just at a random stranger? Or just I would, general? yes, I would. I mean, you'd stand at traffic lights, and there I am, all dressed up, and, and I don't mean demonstratively like a full-on drag queen, but just, you know, a normal day, a bit of makeup on, regular clothes and things like that. But somehow I'd get sprung. So when a mother standing at traffic lights pulls her children away from you, get away from that person, you know, kind of thing. The sense of a devalued human being <laughs> washes over you, and so you learn to put up a barrier, a, you know, some kind of screen that I was affected by that, and I would just have to sort of, you know, stand up more staunchly about it, sometimes even verbally get quite aggressive about it, because if you can throw that at me, then I can throw it back at you. I mean, drove me to suicide, uh, to, you know, to attempt suicide on three times um, in my young life, uh, late teens and early 20s. I had been pack raped in Sydney in 1979, which was a terrifying, horrifying experience. And the law didn't defend me. This was in Australia and made me feel even more worthless as a person. And so you begin to ask yourself, why am I tolerating this terrible life and might as well do away with myself? It was just so easy to fall into that kind of thought. Well, thank God I didn't succeed. But it gave me the drive after those suicide attempts and all of that uh, nastiness that, that went on to, what can I do to change this? This has to change, this has to change. And I had no idea how I would do that. So but, where did the next idea come from? Well, I was fortunate enough, whilst living in Auckland in the early to mid-1980s, to um, get involved in a, a short film for a Television One drama series 
uh, about a day in the life of a transsexual and a transvestite. I didn't realise at the time that I was in probably one of the trailblazing television dramas that dealt with that subject matter in its reality, as opposed to some fictional, over-the-top kind of depiction of transgender people. And that earned me a Best Actress nomination in 1987 for our Film and Television Awards that year. And what I won was the fact that my peers in the industry at the time gave me the dignity of nominating me in the gender to which I identified. So that boosted my sense of self-esteem considerably. Throughout the 1980s, Georgina Beyer was working in a gay nightclub in Auckland, but like so many events in her life, change would be just around the corner. 1990, I found myself in uh, the Wairarapa, living in a small town called Carterton. And this is when I had decided that I was going to, actually, I, I need to get some more practical skills to be able to work in the real world. And I'm doing a 20-week life skills course. And after I did that 20-week course, I uh, was then asked to teach the, uh, the drama component on that course, which was all great. And it was all new for me to be, I, I didn't think I'd be able to sort of teach that kind of thing, but I was able to. I was also part-time doing work on a new FM radio station in Carterton, or the wider rapper at the time, called Today FM, owned and started by one Paul Henry. And um, I was doing breakfast news reading uh, with him until he paid me about 10 bucks a bloody session. 1991 budget, the mother of all budgets, Ruth Richardson's budget, which wiped about 25% off benefits. It had a devastating effect around the country. And we were climbing out of the financial crises of the 1980s. Freezing works were closing down around the country. Many people, particularly Māori, were finding themselves unemployed, displaced. And in Carterton, we experienced a little bit of homelessness. And as I was now involved in the community centre proper, we decided that you know, it could be part of our job to try and take care of this homelessness situation. And I guess that's when I first started being involved in public life like that. And then 1992, the uh, local body elections come around and my little group of friends and colleagues at the community centre said, um, we think you should run for the local council, of which I gasped and said, are you kidding me? What the hell do they do? And, um, you know, and that kind of thing. But because I had uh, been pushed forward to be, the, to be the voice of our little submission to council when we wanted some assistance with um, temporary accommodation and they refused us, because they reckoned that that was a central government responsibility, not local government responsibility, which was sort of a bit strange since they had pensioner housing. But in this case, no, they, they weren't going to help. So, so you get there, you get to council. You've now gone from Vivian Street to Auckland, and now you're in Carterton, mm -hmm. a rural, traditional, conservative place. Yes. And you're being put forward for the chains of office. I think certainly my friends around me at the time at the community centre had long put aside my colourful past and my gender and actually took more notice of the substance of the person. And because I was eloquent, I could speak well and I could sell our, our pitch to council in this case, uh, they thought that I might be a good advocate because I was sort of basing a lot of my stuff around human rights, dignity, um, a cohesive community. And so I had a shot in 1992 at the, at the election and I, I ran on a ticket with a retired vicar, the Reverend William Woodley Hartley, so lots of actress and bishop jokes went on and things like that. But, um, uh, but we had fun and we used it as a platform to air some of our issues. Um, I missed out in that election. I was the highest polling unsuccessful candidate. I've missed out by 14 votes and thought, wow. Recount? Uh, for this you know, strange and exotic person to arrive in this rural town to suddenly sort of have a poke at the holy cow called the local council. You know, I thought I did pretty well. <laughs> but um, we had a resignation um, by the newly elected Baptist minister. And while the council could have uh, um, appointed me because I was the next highest polling candidate, they wanted to avoid uh, a person such as myself uh, getting anywhere near that council table. And so they put up a few candidates 
and uh, I ran in the urban ward in the by-election and I got half the votes and the three or four other candidates shared the rest of the votes. In other words, the, uh, uh, the urban ward constituents voting for their sort of gave the finger to the council and said, whether you like it or not, you're going to get it. So in 1995, I, I served, I did not quite a full term as a councillor and that was my learning period because I knew nothing about local government, I can tell you. But the Resource Management Act had uh, just been started to be implemented at the time and I seized my opportunity because I was effectively shut out of any of the major decision making and stuff around the table. If they had to tolerate me, they'd tolerate me from a distance. One of the things that council needed to do was establish a consultative procedure with local iwi. So they turned to the first and only brown face sitting at the table making the mistaken assumption that I was steeped in tikanga Māori and understood te reo so beautifully well that I'd be able to run away and come up with something. I was totahere to the Wairarapa. I didn't even have any real tribal connections to there. So for local iwi over there, I was sort of, you know, I had to be handed over by my people from Taranaki to Kahunganu and, and Rangitane. And so I seized my opportunity to come back with a draft um, uh, plan for how we might have a consultative procedure with our local iwi. And I remember the council ready to rubber stamp it right there at one of the ordinary meetings. I said, well, excuse me, don't you think we'd better go out and present this to the local marae? And then, of course, thank God I kept my textbooks from the, um, uh, from the one-year course that I'd done at the Polytech because I was able to write the mayor's by kōrero he wouldn't have had a clue what I'd written down there, but um, I, I sort of took it out of the book and I had to do the kāranga and I had to do the waiata and all of that. Suddenly I became an important and valuable member of council as far as those things were concerned. Next, your shoulder tapped for that other safe seat, the wider upper one. Right. Well, can I just first say, when the mayoralty happened in 1995, I was as blown away as anybody else was that I would be successful. I had taken a risk in even running for the mayoralty, but you could run for the mayoralty and also for a council position. I felt fairly sure I'd get back on the council because I'd become popular. I was a hard-working councillor. So the mayoralty, I thought, oh, that's a bit of a push. But no, I was. they elected me with a pretty you know, reasonable majority. And that was a remarkable thing. So now I was really into it, still asking the question, and what the hell do I do now? Okay, I'm the mayor. Okay, where's the handbook on this job? There isn't any. But I now was in this position and I thrived in it, absolutely thrived in it. Why? Um, I just loved the contact with the people, that I could actually have an influence along with my councillors and along, I was a, I was consensus person, I was a participatory democracy person, I wanted people to know and understand what the hell it is we do, you know, at this council, and I want your input, I'm begging for your input, where most councillors say, oh yes, yes, we'll just keep it over there, no, I want, and I started to do things that was sort of unconventional for that particular, you know, council at the time, allowing people to have their say. So you didn't give yourself a lot of um, chance to become the mayor, what about coming to parliament? And that seat, did you give yourself much of a chance of winning that seat? No, I didn't, but again, I, no, not at all. And I frankly don't think the Labour Party thought I would be successful there. I don't think anybody would have thought that I would be successful there. But, oh, it's a nice, colourful character, and Labour was all about diversity and inclusion, and I ticked at least three boxes, Māori, transgender, woman. And uh, so I was going to fit in uh, there somewhere. Uh, but Sonia Davies came to visit me one day in my mayoral office, on the auspices of wanting to talk about our local health issues, particularly our hospital, which was under some threat at the time in Masterton. And by the time she walked out of my office, she had me signed up as a member of the Labour Party. <laughs> and so the ball started rolling. So what made you say yes? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. What was I going to lose? I had just secured my second term uh, in my mayoralty in 1998 with a 90% majority, so I thought, oh, that's safe. So now we can give this a go and, again, use it as a platform to air some of the issues that I had now as a local civic leader for our Wairarapa area, at least anyhow. And so I, I, I did use that as a platform. I thought, if anything else happens, that'll be useful. No stranger to colourful situations, in 1999, the mayor threw her hat into the ring to become a member of parliament. But first, she had to beat her national party opponent. Oh, by the way, that national party candidate happened to be one 
Paul Henry, broadcaster and man of many opinions. And um, <laughs> he was running around with his family, his two little girls then at the time, and his then wife, um, you know, in his gold Mercedes, uh, preaching family values and things up and down the electorate. But he always has the smarmy way about him, really, uh, Paul Henry. And we had our first television outing as candidates in that seat for that election on the Paul Holmes show, who did a little feature on, on us there, because it looked like a slightly interesting contest in the wider upper. And he made at least one, probably two, big gaffes on that outing. Uh, when asked about, um, oh, Georgina Byers had a very interesting and exciting life, and, and he was sort of, oh, yes, well, yes, Georgina has had an interesting life, but then again, so have I, and at least at the end of the day, I'm still a man. Went down like a ton of bricks. Rumour has it that Shipley, English, and Creech were in the PM's office, Shipley was the PM at the time, um, <laughs> um, watching Henry's first outing as a candidate for them, and apparently the campaign manager who might have been in the office at the same time turned around and said, I think we just lost the wire wrapper. And, and not just lost the wire wrapper, you gave him quite a hiding. I did. I came in with a 3,000 majority, and we won the party vote. Uh, by about a thousand. So that was like unheard of um, for Labour in the wider upper at that time under MMP. And so, um, yeah, I can't remember, and who cares, um, how many votes Paul got. But How um, good did it feel to beat him? It wasn't so much about beating him, it was about, oh my God, I'm now a member of Parliament and I've won a seat and Really, what has happened in the world that the colourful backstory to me is sort of put to one side, and again, I come back to this thing of um, people put that aside. My audition had been in local government in the area, so all the farmers up north had talked to my councillors and that, who were also local farmers, what she like, what she can do. So I think people looked at the substance of the person. I was someone that would do things and get things done and give it my best shot. They had watched and observed me doing that as a mayor and as a civic person. And that I also had some, excuse the term, some balls about me. And they like that. <laughs> so people appreciated that you had the balls to come here and make a difference. And you did from the moment you stepped in here. Mm. Your maiden speech is still being talked about to, these, to this day. Yes, and I never wrote it. I remember the press gallery and the speaker at the time, Jonathan Hunt, asking for a copy of my maiden speech before I was to deliver it, and uh, you know, in the house. And um, I said, "Oh, well, you'll get it as soon as I've uh, as soon as I've said it." Oh, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, I haven't written a speech. Because I started, I tried to write a speech, and it sounded so phony, and so I ad-libbed it. Where did the famous line come from? I have no idea, I don't know, it just mean my warped sense of humour, I don't know. But I went in with a thought, OK, OK, this is major. Um, how am I going to break the ice as far as my uh, gender and uh, et cetera is concerned in this place? The countries, this parliaments, the world's first transsexual woman to be serving in this place, and so what am I going to do here to break the ice with the homophobes that are in the place, with the transphobes, that are with the conservative nature of many members, even including in the Labour Party, who are sort of a bit sideways looking at this creature that's arrived in Parliament. So humour has always been a fabulous way of uh, um, breaking down the tension. Do you remember the line? I do. I said something along the lines of, uh, Mr Speaker, this is the stallion that became a gelding and then a mayor. And now I seem to have found myself to be a member. And everyone cracked up and it did break the ice. And so people didn't have to walk on eggshells around me or vice versa. There we are. There it is on the table. It's been said. I mentioned that it was historic for our country and the world, um, you know, to get it out there. And so I think it's something we can be proud of as opposed to sort of, oh, I don't know, and how's this going to reflect? Well, I have to say, if I say so myself, I think it's reflected very well. <laughs> so in your eight years here, in your time in Parliament, and, and there are a number of achievements that we could go through. Mm. And... I won't because it'll take us a long time to get yes. through them all. But what are you most proud of here? 
I'm proud of uh, um, delivering a lot for my electorate, I think, at the time, whether it comes to new hospitals, whether it came to roading infrastructure and things like that, dealing with some of the worst child murders in the country at the time, Lily Bing, the Applin Jetson sisters, Coral Allen Burrows, um, all of that time to sort of be there and, um, and have a role to play, sometimes a little behind the scene as opposed to in front. Um, the sensitivities around that. So electorate-wise, me and my staff worked our butts off to deliver as best we could, and we loved it. We thrived in it. We thoroughly enjoyed doing that. In fact, I've always sort of said, if I could have actually spent 60 or 70% of my time doing my pastoral work in the electorate, oh, my parliamentary life would have been fantastic. Uh, but no, half the time has to be spent here in Parliament, and that's part of the job. Uh, proud to have been support uh, behind uh, Tim Barnett when civil unions came along. That was another incremental step towards uh, marriage equality, which came 10 or so years later. And very proud, given my um, early background in the sex industry, to have been a strong advocate for prostitution reform. If I had ever thought when I was on Vivian Street back in those days that I would find myself in a position uh, to be able to change the law. You're a modest person. Some would say not. <laughs> yeah, but you, you're, oh. you, you've just gone through a number of achievements and attributed them to everybody else, not yourself. No, uh, no, because for those of us that are fortunate enough to find ourselves in a position of influence, it's our duty, <laughs> well, I believe anyhow, to do your best, to give it your best shot. You're here, you're here now. This may never come up again. That was part of the civil union argument. OK, we could hang around and wait for marriage equality, but it ain't going to happen at that time. So let's go for what we can get now. And by the time we did get to marriage equality, a majority of the country, by polling, are saying, for God's sake, give it to them. Attitudinal change on social issues, it doesn't happen overnight. And you're not going to get these things happening unless you bring the country along with you. But with where you came from, you could quite easily have stood here and gave the finger to all of those people who had ever doubted you, who had shouted at you. Well, I sort of did, didn't I, really, without being so overt about it, because at the end of the day, we won. <laughs> and that's what matters. I mean, I was just here for a brief time. I could have been in here in Parliament a lot longer than perhaps I was, but I had run out, I think. I mean, you talk about what were some of my highlights while being in Parliament and being able to be a part of. There were also some quite low lights, and for sure in CB, it'd have to be one of those. In 2004, the Labour government legislated away the ability of Māori to test their rights to the foreshore and seabed before the courts, pitting Labour's Māori caucus against their own constituents. Ah, a disaster. An absolute nightmare. The Māori caucus of the day, of which it was quite a large chunk at that time of uh, the New Zealand Labour Party, we were all quite taken aback um, that an announcement had been made, no consultation with anyone in the Māori caucus. And I have to say, for the weeks or whatever it was, I, it's such a terrible time, I can't even remember how long it took between the toing and froing between the Māori caucus and Michael Cullen and into his office and, the, and all of that that was happening as we were trying to negotiate around how this kind of legislation could work. But at the end of the day, it was one of the largest uh, proposed confiscations from Māori um, in modern times. And really, one by one, the Māori caucus members uh, fell into line. And uh, the last three standing really were myself, Nanaya, and um, Tariana, of course. And I was in a very strange position. I was Māori, yes, I held a general seat. My seat and constituents were telling me, you vote in favour. I didn't hold a Māori constituency. I had no mandate from Māori to speak up strongly on their behalf like the rest of my colleagues did. I was just so torn. But actually, I didn't have to be steeped in tikanga Māori to understand that this was wrong, wrong, wrong. And I vowed and declared from that time on that I would never be torn between who and what I am as far as my heritage is concerned and political expediency. What was your relationship like with Helen Clark before that? And what was it like after? I was never very close to Helen at all, really, in lots of ways. Of course, see each other caucus and things like that, but I, I was not within her inner, outer, 
or extra outer circle, really. I was just Canon Fodder backbench MP. When I was going through tedious times, uh, certainly over the child murder things, in the wider rapper, I think on one occasion after Coral Allen Burroughs, I, I had gone to a one-day caucus at Premier House, and I was just so deflated, defeated, and I felt terrible and depressed, frankly, at what was happening. And that was one of the few times when Helen came to me as a human being and just put her arm around me and, and said, because I sort of said, my God, what are we going to do about this? Our, our SIFs, our child, youth and family, and of course Ruth Dyson, as the Minister of Social Development, um, came and changed the whole thing completely, which was great. Um, that was one of the closest times I had. Helen visited my electorate on a few occasions, but I was not on, uh, in fact, I was quite a loner, a lonely person as far as being a member of caucus, and I, a lot of distrust went on because I would be closer to some people than others, but then you soon learn not to confide too much uh, because that could be used against you in some way, and who's going to go pss, 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 back in Helen's ear? Ms Bayer became further isolated from Clark when she asked to abstain from the vote for the foreshore and seabed legislation. Her request was rejected and the bill was passed into law. I can almost pinpoint my beginning of the end of my political career in Parliament on that foreshore and seabed thing. I felt defeated and I felt impotent and I wasn't going anywhere. And come 2005, when I, I wanted to stand down then, I did stand down from the seat, but I got persuaded to return uh, on the list after the 2005 election because I'd acquitted myself so well during the Enough is Enough march and all of that advocacy I did standing up for the human rights of, of the rainbow community, but uh, significant minorities in general. And so I came back and it was sort of a much tidier way for me to leave Parliament without causing a by-election or anything like that. What would you have liked to have done in Parliament? Anything else? Are there any regrets that you have? No. I, I, oh, yes, in the sense that um, I wonder if I could have done more. I did a lot of travel. Uh, Helen did allow me to travel overseas whenever I had an invitation. By the way, the taxpayer of this country never paid for all that travel except for the three or four select committee trips that I might have been on. But the rest was out there. So I was doing United Nations stuff. I was doing uh, um, HIV and AIDS stuff. And I was out there as the world's first transsexual, not only selling what we do in our country very well, but also telling the story. I remember even after I'd finished in Parliament, I got invited to go to Nepal by one of their first out gay MPs, Sunil Babu Pant, because they were writing their new constitution after the monarchy had collapsed. And Sunil was on their human rights uh, committee that was drafting the human rights chapter. And they were proposing to include what was called the third gender to be protected in their constitution. And because I was the world's first transsexual woman, et cetera, they thought it might be quite good that I come over. I met with their president, which was more of a courtesy call, met with their prime minister, uh, which uh, was also going to be more of a courtesy call, about 15, 20 minutes with him. An hour or so later, I walked out of his office. He was so fascinated and intrigued and, and learned something. And Sunil would say to me now that that meeting influenced, you know, what happened with that part of the constitution. They were the first country in the world to um, include the third gender in their constitution for protection, and India followed soon after. So those kinds of little things that you can do and be a part of in other countries is really you know, an amazing opportunity, gifted to me by the fact that I was a member of this parliament. Going forward, what's your legacy going to be? What are you wanting to do? Well, what I need to do is shut up for a while. Um, there's a new generation of transgender activists, a new generation of young politicians coming through. And I'm glad, although I don't always agree with some of these new transgender activists uh, that have come along and are still pushing um, the barrow on what I would call the minutiae of stuff that needs to be tidied up, although it's quite big for the transgender community. I'm pleased that my legacy for them has been uh, that I trailblazed and, and started a pathway, not just for them to have a voice, uh, a voice that's heard and listened to and acted upon, but for the world, we now have numerous transgender people who are elected to their um, legislatures around the world. 
I was the first for about three or four years until someone in Poland got elected, until someone in Italy got elected, and now they're sort of everywhere. We now have, in 2020, our first transgender US senator. Do you think George, at four or five, will be proud? I think he might be, and unexpectedly so. <laughs> You know, you've got to live on the edge of it, and that's what life is, is sort of about. And I'm glad that, yes, I've faced a lot of adversity, but you can't live in your victimhood all the time. You can't wallow in it. You've got to learn from it, move on and change it, and change what, you know, created that. And I hope I've been able to do a bit of that. Kia ora. Ka nui te mihi, kia irirangi te motu, 